That gets us to chapter 35 and the move to Bethel. Um, Jacob has already called a place Bethel, the house of God, the, the place uh, where we meet God. In chapter 35, evidently Jacob begins to grow in his conviction that he needs to do a better job of being a priest to his family, that it's his responsibility to lead his family to worship the one true God. Um, and that is a father's responsibility. Um, some of you are single, maybe all of you, well, not all of you, but some of you are single. And when you marry, you need to keep this in mind. Uh, the man you marry needs not only to be attractive, but the man, you, the man you marry needs not only to be able to bring money to you and support to you, but the man you marry needs to know how to take you to God. The man you marry needs to know how to lead your children to God. Uh, it's not enough to marry somebody who says that they're a believer. There needs to be evidence as to whether they're a believer. There needs to be evidence of whether they're in touch with God. And one reason Jacob's family was in such a mess is that even though formally and traditionally and technically the family worshipped the God of Abraham, personally and practically and actually they did not. So after this horrible slaughter, Jacob gets it into his mind that, well, maybe I need to pay more attention to this. So look at chapter 35, verse 2. Well, he builds an altar in chapter 35, verse 1. Remember the di difference we saw in Abraham and Isaac. Abraham would move to a place and he would build an altar. Then he would dig a well. Isaac would move to a place and he would dig a well. Then he would build an altar. For Abraham, spiritual things came first. Now Jacob begins to pay attention to the spiritual things in his life and he begins to bring the attention of spiritual things to his family. He begins to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. And he says, put away the foreign gods which are among you. Purify yourselves, change your garments. Let us go and worship. Let's go and worship at the altar. Let's go to the place where God answered me, where he answered my prayer. Um, and so they gave up their altars. They gave up their charms. They gave, they gave up their idols. They gave up their religious relics, these, these uh, pieces of jewelry and stone and metal, which were somehow connected to false worship. And it's a shocking thing to realize that the great-grandchildren of Abraham would be moving around in all these places and carrying their idols with them, carrying their religious charms with them. And I think, as we said yesterday, you know, when we study these passages of Scripture, we want to consider the passages historically, what happened in the storyline, in the narrative. We want to consider the passages theologically, what does it teach us about God? We want to consider the passages spiritually. What does it mean about my relationship with God, my response to God? And we want to consider the passages practically in terms of application. What am I supposed to do? We may have other gods in our lives which are not connected to anything material. We may have material gods. In the West, the god is money and materialism. It can be something that is apparently innocent. Family can be a God. Romance can be a God. Success can be a God. Status can be a God. How can we recognize a God? Anything we think about most is probably a God. Anything we care about the most is a rival to the one true God. What do we really care about? What do we really think about? What do we look forward to with the greatest delight and pleasure? That's probably a God in our life. And God will tell Moses in the first commandment, you will have no other gods before me. You will think of nothing more than me. You will delight in nothing more than me. It's not an easy thing to get the idols out of our lives. As a matter of fact, it's something we can only do with God's strength. 
And let's just say that in chapter 35, after this terrible, terrible two things which happened, your daughter becomes a victim of rape and your sons become murderers of your neighbors. Maybe it's time by that time to get serious with God. And that's what begins to happen in chapter 35. Um, they come to Bethel in verse 6. Jacob builds an altar there and he calls it um, the God of Bethel, the God of the house of God. And it says in verse 8 that Rebekah's nurse died and was buried there in Bethel. Evidently, Rebekah, his mother, had already died, but we're not told about it. His father is about to die, and evidently his mother has already died because we're told about the death of his mother's nurse, but not his mother. Uh, it says in verse 9 that God appeared to Jacob again, and he blessed him. And he begins to repeat his, um, his promises to him, and he also reminds him that he's got a new name. His name is Israel, um, the one who, who strives, the one who strives with God. And he says, I am God Almighty. This is Genesis 35, 11, the renewal of the covenant at Bethel, the renewal of the covenant with God at, at Bethel. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a group of nations shall come from you. Kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Um, Jacob set up an, a monument there, just like he'd set up a monument between him and, uh, and his father-in-law, Laban. And uh, again, we keep referring to the name of the place over and over and over and over. He, again, he named the place. Jacob was named a second time. Israel. He'd already been named Israel in chapter 32. Now he's, re he's named Israel again. Well, he'd already named the place in chapter 28. He'd already named the place earlier in chapter 30, 35. But again it says that um, he named the place Bethel in verse 15 of chapter 35. Then they begin to leave Bethel and to journey on and they go to a place called Ephrath, and in that place, Rachel has a baby, and Rachel dies during childbirth. Um, history is not like novels. In novels, the author can make the ending as happy as he wants to make the novel. I've read the great novel of your country. I've read it and I've loved it, War and Peace, which in the West, pretty much, we believe it's the greatest novel ever written. I don't know if in Russia you believe it's the greatest Russian novel, but in the West we believe it's the greatest Russian novel. And, of course, in that novel, Pierre Bezuhoff uh, makes an early, unwise marriage with Helen and he marries her because she's beautiful and she wears a low-cut dress and he looks at her in that dress and he thinks I've got to have her and he marries her and it's very stupid and very soon she likes somebody else and very soon uh, he likes somebody else too and he makes that great declaration of love for her after she's been spurned was it Natasha? I can't remember her name. But anyway, was it Natasha? Um, and and he, there's that great declaration of love, and he, he said, um, if I were someone else, if I were not myself, but if I were somebody handsome, if I were somebody young, if I were someone clever, and above all, if I was free, then you would know how wonderful you are, because I would tell you. Well, Soon after that, his wife dies, and so he is free, and he does marry her eventually. Well, you can do that in a novel. That's not what happens always in history, though. 
That's not what always happens in real life. I don't know if Jacob ever thought, I wish Leah would die. It would have been a very human thing to think. I don't know if Jacob was above that. Or I don't know if it's something that he thought about from time to time. But I know one thing. I know that he never thought, I wish Rachel would die. I know he never thought that. I know that's the great thing he dreaded in his life. And yet Leah did not die. It was Rachel who died. And the great thing that Rachel wanted is she wanted to be a mother and she wanted to have children and she wanted to have sons. And she was given a second son, but she died. Her life was taken as she gave that life to the world. I think maybe the greatest thing we trust God with is who lives and who dies. As far as I know, Osama bin Laden is alive. Fidel Castro is alive. The ruler of North Korea is alive. There are many people who are alive and we wonder, why did God let them live? Why are they still alive? Well, there are many other people, maybe a child, maybe a great missionary, maybe those 10 aid workers who were killed by the Taliban in Afghanistan on August 12th. Why are they dead? They were young. They were good. Why are good people dead and young people dead while bad people and old people are alive. That's a hard thing to trust God with, isn't it? That may, be, that may be the biggest, biggest thing that we do trust God with. And yet from the very beginning, God showed us that it would be like this. Cain does not die. Abel dies. The good brother is slain. The evil brother lives. God even protected the evil brother and put a mark on it. God did not protect the younger brother. Barabbas is released and lives. Jesus is kept and killed. This is what the world is like. We live in a fallen world. To know God does not mean that God protects us from the immediate consequences of sin. It is sin which has brought death in the, into the world. It is sin which has brought suffering into the world. Natural calamities like sickness and death at childbirth and earthquake and storms and, and floods and human spiritual wickedness like murder and criminality. All of these things have entered the world because of the fall and, and because of sin. And becoming a believer does not mean that we are protected from the immediate consequences of sin. Becoming a believer means that we are protected from the ultimate consequences of sin. Becoming a believer means that when we die, we receive Christ's reward. In this life, we suffer. In this life, hard things happen. And that's one reason your faith is so precious because faith is sometimes difficult. C.S. Lewis, Lewis wrote a book about the problem of suffering and how suffering has a tendency to make us doubt whether God is really there or whether God is really good. The name of the book was The Problem of Pain. And C.S. Lewis says a very interesting thing at the beginning of the book. He says all the great creedal formulations of the church, in other words, all the great doctrines of the church, all the great proclamations of Christians which say that God is good, they were written a long time ago. They were written before anesthetics. You know what an anesthetic is? That's something that takes the pain away when you have a medical procedure. It was written, those things were written before you could put somebody to sleep and operate on them. If you had to cut off their arm or you had to cut off their leg, you had to do it while they were awake. They felt all the pain. Before there was anything in the world to ease any kind of pain, believers said, 
God is good. Yes, there's great suffering, but God is good. Yes, there's death, there's agony, there are terrible things, but God is there. He's real and God is good. That's faith. Well, at the beginning of chapter 35, God renews the covenant with Jacob. He says, I'm going to do great things for you. I'm going to do great things for your family. I'm going to make your family a blessing for the whole world, for all of time. But who does Jacob care most about in his family? He cares about Rachel. He's been madly in love with her since the first time he ever saw her. God's plan included something grand, something great, something wonderful, something permanent. God's plan including something hard, something painful, something that Jacob would have never wanted to happen. I mean, I'm sure Jacob would have said, why don't you just let me be not important? Why don't you just let me be not famous? Why don't you just let me be a regular, average guy? But just leave me with this woman whom I love with all my heart. That's all I want. I don't want to be great. I just want to have this beautiful, fabulous woman whom I love so much. Scripture tells us the truth. Scripture tells us what life is like. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. All this happens in the neighborhood of Bethlehem. Um, and Jacob again builds a monument over the grave of, of Rachel. And um, he buries his wife and he, he travels on. We're told something else in chapter 36 that makes us know how truthful the Scripture is. Remember, Jacob had taken the, um, the servant girl of his wife for his wife, um, Bilhah, his father's concubine. Well, Reuben, his oldest son, actually slept with his his father's concubine, and, is, and, and Jacob learned about it. We're told the, um, in summary, um, the twelve sons of, of Jacob, uh, the sons of Leah, the sons of Rachel, the sons of, of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, which is the woman that Reuben took after her mistress died the sons of, of Zilpah, and uh, of course there was also the daughter, um, Dinah. The next thing that happens in chapter 36, 35 is that Isaac dies. He, he dies at a, a very old age, um, and his two sons, Esau and Jacob, bury him. Now, Genesis 36 is mostly a genealogy, and it has to do basically with the descendants, the descendants of descendants of Esau. The descendants of Esau gave Israel trouble for hundreds of years. Those people called the Edomites. Those people who live in much of what is now the country of Jordan. Um, this brother of Jacob, whom he was reconciled with, had children who were never fully uh, uh, reconciled to the children of Jacob. So chapter 36 is basically a, a chronicle of the family of Esau. Uh, genealogies are very important in the history of Israel. It was important who your father was and who your grandfather was. It was important which tribe you came from. One of the difficulties 
in Orthodox Judaism, if they got their wish and they rebuilt their temple, and if they were able to renew sacrifices, the question is, who would be the priests? Because they don't know who's descended from Levi. Everyone named Cohen should be made a priest because the word Cohen in Hebrew means priest, but that's silly. It's silly to think that every Jew whose name is Cohen today would be descended from Levi. So genealogies are very, very important. And until the generation of Jesus, every Jew knew which tribe he was from. After the deportation and the scattering after 70 AD, when the Jews were either killed or taken to the slavery markets in Alexandria and sold into slavery, scattered from Palestine, scattered throughout the world, for many centuries they have not known what tribe they're in. But they kept very, very strict records. And that's one reason we're given the record of Esau's family in chapter 36.